Okay, good evening everybody. Thank you very much for making the time to come to the Working Mums Masterclass webinar for May 2012. Very excited to have Nicole Avery uh, from Planning with Kids and she's going to be talking about time management for mums. Uh, the broadcast is now starting. All mm -hmm. attendees are in listen-only mode. <laughs> Hi ladies, welcome to the Working Mums Masterclass webinar for May 2012. Uh, my name's Penny and I'm the founder of Working Mums Masterclass. I really appreciate you making the time to come along tonight and um, listen to what our fabulous Nicole Avery from Planning with Kids has got to say regarding time management uh, for mums. So before we get started, I just want to go through some housekeeping. So we're actually recording uh, this webinar tonight and we will have the recording up on the Working Mums website um, when uh, when I upload it, it'll be up by the end of the week. So if it drops out or anything like that or you have trouble with the internet or you've got to run off and um, soothe a crying child, please don't worry, we'll have the recording up for you. Now another thing to remember is that you can hear us but we can't hear you. So the way that we actually interact is we've got on the right hand side of your screen down the bottom you'll see a, a questions box with a plus next to it and a chat box at the bottom right. So you can actually just um, expand those boxes and type in um, responses to anything that we ask live on the webinar or put in comments, anything that you want to do. It's a way that we can interact with you guys. Now if you have any technical problems, Citrix, who are the host of the webinar, have a 1-800 number. Grab a pen if you've got one handy and you can call that, <coughs> pardon me, you can call that 1-800 number 1-800-356-792 um, if you do have any technical problems. If your internet connection is dropping in and out, and you're connected using a set of headphones, for example, just use the landline that's on your registration email to uh, ring in and you'll be able to hear us fine. Like I said, use the chat box on the right. Um, we've already got somebody um, jumping in there, which is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and enjoy yourself tonight. Sit back and relax and hopefully you've got a cup of tea or a glass of wine or um, something next to you as well. So we'll run for about 45 to 50 minutes, 55 minutes or so. If you are tweeting, we've got a hashtag. It's WMM webinar. So feel free to tweet about that. All right. So let's get right into it. Um, time management. It's, such an, it's an area that we're all um, so desperate <laughs> to get right and I don't think there's a secret formula or anything like that. It's definitely about um, working out what's right for you and your family. So Nicole, I'll hand over to you if you let the girls know all about yourself and then step through your, um, your wonderful tips. That would be fantastic. Thanks Penny. Thanks for having me tonight and thanks very much for everyone for joining on the line and know what um, evenings are like. It's a precious time, so thanks for attending. Um, I think it's always nice to know a little bit about the person who's talking. So I guess in brief, how I sum myself up as a mum to five, a blogger, author, coach, runner, a lover of Diet Coke and spreadsheets. And you'll see throughout the presentation, I use spreadsheets quite a bit. I've been blogging at Playing with Kids for just over four years now and it's basically became, uh, it's my part-time job. It's uh, something that I love to do and I feel like I'm in a very great position to be having a part-time job to work from home doing something that I love. And um, the, blog, the blog was turned into a book last year so I've got a book out as well. So there's things that are keeping me busy and I think as I've grown to manage the family and my work commitments, um, I've probably progressed a bit with um, my time management. And something that I like to say at all presentations that I do is that um, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking I automatically did this from day dot when I first had kids. Um, for me, being organised and organising my time has been something that I've grown into and something that has evolved. Um, I didn't do any of this stuff as a lot of this stuff at the start when I had kids, when I had a family and I often look back now and think I wish I did some of this with baby number two and number three, it would be lots easier and things would have run a lot smoother. But um, you know, as, you, you, as a parent I think it is a journey and you know, I've learnt so much and being able to cope and manage my time far more effectively, mainly because it's something I've worked at 
and I think as Penny said, there's no secret trick to time management, but it is something that I've spent a bit of time working at mainly because I do like to fit a few things in. I, I like to have time for me, I like to have time for my family, and I love having time for my job too. So that's, I guess, been my own incentive to, I guess, you know, keep working at my time management and reinvent some processes. So what I'm suggesting here today is I've got about eight tips I go through, um, and I guess I encourage you to try some of them. Um, and one thing that happens when you're working, I think, with any form of change is that, um, it can be overwhelming if you think you've got to do everything. So if you know you find that you're really quite in love with time management, just choose one of the eight that I put through today and give that a go for a week or two. See if it works because often things don't work straight away. And what I suggest may not be just spot on for your family. You may need to tweak a little to get it right for you and for your family, but sometimes it just needs more than a one-go attempt. You know, especially when you're introducing things and it involves kids, often you've got to do things over and over and over again. I think, what is it they say, it's 21 days to create a habit. So some of this stuff, you know, don't think that you're going to go, if you go and do it tomorrow, it's going to work straight away. But it will, you know, it's the, you know, the, the whole pantene thing, it might not happen overnight night but it will happen. So um, just encourage you to give it a go. What I've done, because I do mention a few links and often when you're in a webinar it's hard to remember and note all things down, I've created one page in my blog where you'll basically see these slides and you'll see links to all the things that I mentioned. And that is, as you'll see on the screen, it's planningwithkids.com um, slash time. So all the links that you'll need are there and there's also a facility there that you can leave a comment if you had any further other questions that we may not cover tonight. So we might move on to the next slide, Penny. That's yep. um, sure the thing. first tip that I start with. Um, and in the coaching work I do, one of the things that I find happens a lot when we comes to managing our time is that um, mums often just don't even know where to start with all the things that they're pulled in, the different directions they're pulled, the different things that they want to do, the things that they want to achieve with their kids, with their family, with their work. And you know, I can really understand that. And setting personal goals for me has been something that has worked really, really well to allow me to even think about what do I want to do with my time? Because that's, I guess, the, a basic question for me is, okay, I do have this time and yes, it is limited. I need to be really clear because it's quite a precious commodity. So I need to be really clear about where do I want to spend my time? What is it that I want to achieve? And by setting these goals, it actually then allows me a fantastic decision framework. When there's different opportunities that come up and when there is invites to go around and then it's sort of like, okay, well, am I going to do this because it's helping me achieve my goal? Is this something I want to do? Is this where I like to spend my time? Because sometimes in the day-to-day -day business of family life, you accept stuff on and you do this and you do that. And then, you know, I think probably all have the times that you look back and you think, when was the last time I saw my really, really close girlfriend? You may have seen a whole bunch of other people recently, but because it's not on your list of priorities and they haven't called you or you haven't managed to work it out, it's not something that happened. So what I've done is I've, I've sort of worked hard at, at setting some goals for the different areas of my life that are important to me. Um, I've sort of used, when I set my goals, I use um, a pretty well-known technique, which is the SMART goal. So it's about making sure they're really specific, so they're not airy-fairy. I need to really focus on what are these key things and make them down so they're clear and defined. They're measurable. You know, it's not going to be, I, when I first started setting goals, I would just be things like, oh, you know, I, I want to have more time for me. And then that's really well and great, but you know, how, how do I know if I've actually achieved that because I haven't really put anything measurable around it. And then it needs to be attainable, like, you know, I, I maybe I want to, um, you know, have two hours each day to, to write during the middle of the day. I would love that, but it's simply not going to be attainable in my life structure. And, you know, they need to be realistic, you know. Do I have the skills even to do this, you know? Um, you know, is my skill set going to help me do that? And when do I want to achieve these goals by? So there's a, there's a, a chart and a sheet I have on my blog which goes through this whole step. But even for me, setting personal goals over the last year or two has really been something that I've even worked harder at because you can set goals and that's fantastic, but then can you achieve them and, and can you actually, you know, with all these goals that you set, do you have enough time to allocate to them? And when I first started setting goals, I set myself 10. And I then soon became a bit stressed because I had these 10 goals that I wanted to achieve yet I wasn't really hitting the mark on any of them. So now I've kept it really simple and I find that 
it is working the best. I've got four goals and they take over the four key aspects of my life. So I have a work goal, so something about my blogging. I have a goal for the kids. What is it that I want for the kids? And at the moment, um, I've got five kids aging from 13 to 3 and because of just the way things go, we often spend a amount of times with different you know, different parents doing different things and, and getting a bit separate. So one of the things, I, my goal for the family for this year for the kid aspect was that, you know, we have some time in the week where we do something together. And that's a bit of a challenge when you've got those age groups, but it's nice to have that as a goal and it's something that I can really focus on. So then when we get invites for this and for that, I know that actually, you know, I've blocked out Sunday afternoon. That's our family time and I can sort of protect that. So that's where I'm, while I was talking about making decisions, the goals that I know that that's an important goal to me, it helps me make the decision on whether I accept an invite out for myself personally, have I fit that family time in for that week. And then there's time for my husband, so a goal for what I want to do with my relationship with my husband. And then there's some goals for me personally. So, um, you know, there's the four key areas and I don't make them so huge that they are, um, they're not going to be there. You know, I use those techniques. They are very simple, like having family time a week. You know, this year my personal goal is that I want to try and make sure, you know, I eat a bit better, you know, a bit more protein, a bit less carbs. So they're very simple personal goals, but they actually allow me to make better decision making and use my time a lot better. Do you set goals, Penny? See there, Penny? Sorry, um, I, I muted myself, sorry, because my... Um, that's all right. I was just interested... You would say having a cry <laughs> right. upstairs. I was just interested to see. Um, do you set personal goals? I know you have a lot on your play. I was wondering how you do you yeah. set personal goals as well. I, I really like the way that you've um, put it into four areas. Um, I think that makes it more structured rather than having it willy nilly. I have um, a lot of goals, and I really like the fact that you've put relationship as one area because that's certainly an area having young children as well, just very, you know, a toddler and a preschooler that um, it, you know, I'll be really honest, we went to counselling a few months ago because we weren't prioritising our relationship and we needed to sit down and work out a goal around our relationship. You focus so much on goals on housework and, you know, work and, and time, etc. but sometimes you forget about the people in your life too. Absolutely. I think a couple of the girls have just put in there, we asked whether they've got goals and one of the ones that I really loved is Natalie's put in just having one hour of time to herself each day to read. And that's something that's so simple that can really, I guess, rejuvenate the soul a little bit. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and, and that's like, you know, when I when I would talk throughout some things, you know, I'll probably talk about running, but that's my thing too because that recharges me. It gives mm. me that space out on my own. And, you know, and reading, I adore reading, but, you know, again, at the moment I don't have time for both, so I'm choosing one over the other. Yeah. But it, that's, a, you know, that's a, you know, a beautiful goal, like, you know, an hour every time because one thing I also think about too is that the time invested for those personal goals actually then makes me better on all the other hours that I'm sort of on duty, so to speak. So I try not to feel any guilt about getting up and going to the gym and leaving my husband to do some of the breakfast duty every morning because I come back and I'm in a great mood and I'm feeling really raring to go for the day. And that's almost like an investment in the family, so I sort of try to swing it that way as well. It's an investment in the family, so that one hour of reading, it just gives that time to you know, build that knowledge to, to do those things that you like. And just that you know, the calming aspect that probably comes from it too would then flow on to, I guess, a better day for everyone. Yeah, I agree. I just had a question, um, Nick, just about the SMART goal. Um, yeah. What does the S stand for again? S specific. So specific. it's like, yeah, yeah. So specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and time. Time. Yeah, yeah, great. I've just popped yeah. that up on the um, question box. One of the girls asked about a SMART slide, but I've just put in there what they, what they stand for. But if you Google SMART goals, it will, it will give if, you that, um, the rundown on that. And the, if you go to the time page that I, I link to, it's actually I've got a post where I wrote about it in a bit more detail. And I guess because it often it's a sort of a corporate technique, and I guess I show how I've translated that corporate technique across to my family life. So you can have a have a look at that. Great. But I guess if we move on to the next one, which Absolutely. is um, creating a work plan. And I guess um, one of the things that I, I've found, and this has been probably something I've done probably about the last two to three years, again, you know, whole evolution for me, and I probably found that I needed to do it once I started blogging a bit more and that became my work, um, I needed to fit more things in. And one of the things I think that 
the best thing, even if you're, if you're working or not working, whatever, the best thing the work plan does for me is it really helps me avoid procrastination. It sort of tells me what to do and I quite like being a bit on autopilot. I think any time you can go into autopilot and you sort of know what to do, you're automatically skipping that whole sort of thing of the whole mindset of where am I up to, what am I supposed to do, I've got all this work to do, where do I start sort of thing. Um, procrastination can be just the biggest time waster of all time and I can remember that so many times you've walked back in from the way home from school and you come into a house that, you know, it, it, there's so many, so many things to be done and sort of feeling a bit overwhelmed. So I'd come in and I'd sort of walk around the house and I might pick up one thing and take it to a bedroom and then I'd take it, in, while I was in the bedroom, I might sort of fix up a bed or something. Then I'd see a book and then I'd go to a bookshelf and then before you know it, like an hour is gone. And although I've sort of been busy and I've been doing stuff, I sort of never really achieved any of the things I sort of needed to. So what I, what I started to work around was, um, I guess, the concept of some 15 minute cleaning blocks where, or, 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 a, or I guess a kickstarter job that would be my first thing I do when I get back in, um, you know, and maybe before you go to work or, or for me when, before I get home from, after I get home from the work from school. But it's one of those things where I know that on Mondays, just because of the way we have after school activities, first thing I do when I walk in the door is cook dinner. Then I can get around and I can do other things because often I find once I get started, I can work through all the tasks and I can think a bit logically about it. But if you're a bit tired and I come into the house and I think, oh, I don't know what to do, there's mess over here, where do I start? You know, before you know it, an hour's gone. So having this sort of work plan, which just gives me that prompt and I find that once I get started, then I run through it. You know, for me, my kids have got school uniforms. I wash pretty much every day, but I know that definitely Tuesday and Thursday, if I don't do the wash, then they don't have school they don't have clean uniforms. So I sort of have that as a mental note. It's the first task that I sort of do on those sort of days and it keeps me going. So the task lists on the table aren't the only things that I do, but they're the ones that will kick me over and they get me going. Um, the work plan changes regularly depending on the after school activities we have, you know, my commitments, my husband commitments, um, those sorts of things. But it actually then allows me to actually then I can have a look when I'm setting it up. Also with the work plan, when I go and I look at my goals, one of my goals is about looking after myself. So I get my time for the gym. And I sort of got my family buy-in when I created this work plan. You know, I said to my husband, I want to go to the gym every day, this is what I want to do. He can't commit to being home at any time in the evening. Sometimes he's home at seven o'clock, other times he's home at nine o'clock. So the sort of the non-movable time, most of the time for us is the morning. And one of the things I used to find sometimes it happened was even at the start, he's, oh, I've got a meeting, I'm gonna, I'll be going in early. And it's like, well, okay, well, where do I go to the gym then? And so now we sort of have this arrangement where, yes, sometimes I have to be flexible um, and he has to, in, has to go in early, but it's not always the first thing that moves, it's not my thing, because what used to happen was, it was always my things got moved first, but now these are a pretty solid commitments, and he, if he knows he's going to be away and stuff, he'll let me know as soon as possible so that I can then work other things around. And it's like also too with the kids, um, on the weekend they know that, well actually I don't work Sundays now because the way my, this is a previous one, I normally do my work on Saturday afternoon, but my, my kids know that that's the time when I'm doing my blogging and I am at work and dad is around. So it, the work plan not only works for me and time management, but also I find with the family, sometimes you have to manage their expectations to allow you to get the time. If it's really clear to everyone in the family, these are the things that I'm doing and these are where I'm doing them and why, um, it avoids some of that um, to and fro that happens in the family when the kids want to, you know, oh, no, I want to talk to mum, I need mum to do this. And it's like, no, dad's capable, he is here, he can do that. Um, so that's some of the things that I think a work plan is um, really helpful for. If you go to the timesheet, um, the planning with kids backslash time, there's actually a template you can download. I mean, it's just a Word doc, but sometimes it's just nice if you don't actually have to create everything yourself if you if someone there for you you can put it up and you know I don't always need to look at it and refer to it but when I first started it was prominent position on the fridge and I sort of got the whole family buy-in so that I can make sure I was putting time in the right spots so Nick can I ask then um, we've had a question from Cassie online um, she is married to a chef so they have you know, their night hours, they have the opposite hours yeah. to, to us as well. What would you recommend to Cassie around that? Um, I guess, you know, if she, the, chef, the chef's hours are quite different. Yeah. So I guess if she's trying to fit in um, some time for her, whereas I'm pretty lucky in the morning it's actually quite easy to do because um, 
uh, that, that sort of time. I think the thing is you just got to try and find out there must be some time I guess across the day um, you know where um, there would be normally be two adults in the home mm. and you know I will say that sometimes it, you know to, to get the time that you want it does take sacrifice. My alarm goes off at five forty every morning, um, and you know, so, but that's a choice that I'm making because it gives me something that I want. And so sometimes to get something that you want, you've got to sacrifice something else. And in this case, sometimes it will actually pretty much always is sleep. Um, but you know, for me, it has the benefit. So I guess sometimes it's just about um, you know working out. And if the chef, I guess the thing that sometimes chef's hours can be irregular and that's probably where you are a bit where it is a bit difficult if you've got shift work or irregular hours it's not as easy as me as a partner who works in an office and's got pretty you know they may the, the end time may change but pretty much I know what the core is going to be um, the only thing is I can suggest there is like you probably have far more of a rotational weekly plan where you you um, what we do well we actually just did it today because our sport commitments on the weekend are pretty mad at the moment so <laughs> We generally have a discussion around about Tuesday because we're still a single car family and we're really trying to stay with that. But it does just require logistics to be fairly precision. So if it's like a, you know, where you don't know where they're going to be all the time, that you perhaps pick one one. It might be Sunday evening when you've got your roster for the week or something. You then just fill this in. Okay, well, these are my four slots that I'm going to have this week. And this is where, you know, and my husband does, he plays football, so he has his time as well. And we'll make sure that we slot in all our times. And as opposed to mine, which is pretty, I guess, easy to have consistently set out for the term is pretty much the way mine would work. You may need to set like that a weekly event, like a bit of a time thing each Sunday night before you go to bed, set out a, a bit of a plan for the week about where, where, where are your, um, where's your time going to come from that you want to achieve your goals. You could, um, you could even have them on, say, post-it notes if you had like a calendar. The Kiki K monthly planner is pretty good for that. But if you had yeah, your own planner do. that you did on an Excel spreadsheet or um, you downloaded the Planning with Kids one, if you got little post-it notes um, and then it's literally just moving them around week by week depending on your husband's roster and what you're doing, um, then, it yeah, it just means that it's not as structured but at least yeah. you feel as though there's some foundation for you. Absolutely. And slide three is multitasking. So if we move on to that one. Uh, yep. Um, it's funny because often when people talk about time management stuff, they often think that to achieve a lot of, with your time, you must be doing a lot at once. And there is certain ways that multitasking, you know, can be an effective use of your time. But one of the things that I've found from years of experience of trying to do it and not do it well um, is that it actually does create a false sense of productivity. Um, and there's some things like, for example, like I will fold the washing and maybe make a phone call and that sort of works really well. But some things that I've found that actually end up costing me more time are when I might try to, for example, cook the dinner and listen to my child's reading. The child reading doesn't get listened to properly. I might forget an ingredient in the dinner. Things just don't work. Um, constantly checking my emails on my smartphone. Every now and again, I, I'm generally pretty disciplined, but then I'll go through times. And it's generally when I'm tired. It's a really interesting thing to note about myself. I often find that when I'm tired, I think it's probably to avoid doing something else. I'll start, you know, checking my smartphone a bit regularly. And, you know, so I'll read the emails on my phone. I can't really respond to any of them right now because I've got kids hanging off my legs. So then I'm actually going to go back and read them all again when I get back to, you know, up to my office and stuff. And it's the same things with, like, you know, while I'm, you know, trying to do stuff after school and I might, you know, flick through the school notices. Um, that just doesn't seem to make an effective use of your time. And there's been some really interesting stats come out. Um, and if you, there's a link um, on the time page that I've set up that um, it actually um, it slows you down by as much as 40% trying to do too many things at once. And I just find that if you can actually just single task and single task something effectively, you actually can get through a task much quicker and with better results. So um, just because people often think about, multi, I guess, you know, using your time wisely as doing a super amount in a short period of time, I like to put this one in there just to say, you know what, it's actually really good just to focus and use your, your whole energy on one task, especially when it comes to kids, because I find you can spend, you know, 10 minutes solely on one child as opposed to spending an hour interrupting and answering a phone call and doing all those sorts of things. So, you know, if you are going to sit down with a child for 10 minutes, you know, turn the phone off, don't answer it if it rings, that sort of stuff, turn the TV off and just have 10 minutes of that one sole focus. 
far more effective use of your time than trying to do a number of things at once. The link that, um, that I've put up to goes to an uh, article on Harvard Business Review and it's actually worth reading because he gives you a number of reasons why it doesn't work and, and, um, and, and things he did um, to stop it and the benefits he found from stopping multitasking. So um, for lots of us that like to be busy, it's a, it's a difficult one to break off but it's a really good article if you find yourself falling into the trap of doing a couple of things at once, thinking it's saving you time. I think that's a really good point, Nick. Um, just today, I um, was doing a lot of um, home with one of my children today, and I'd had enough by about three o'clock. And um, Charlie and I just went for a walk around the block, and yeah, I left the phone at home, and it felt so good yeah. to leave the phone and cl literally physically close the door on it. And he got my focus for half an hour in the beautiful sunshine, and it was lovely. And as with kids, you almost build up credits, I think, with that sort of just, you know, one-on-one -on -one attention that then you do, I find with my kids, you do that. And then you can go off and you can get dinner cooked uninterrupted without yep. 20 questions and that sort of stuff. Or it might be you get the washing done or you do something without those uh, constant interruptions because they feel they've had their fill of it and it, it does, it really helps them. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, when you think about it with us and in our relationships, if, if our husbands just listen to us for five minutes, we're good for a week. You know, we're, we're okay Absolutely. for a week. We won't be on that's them all the time. Intent. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a similar sort of analogy. <laughs> very similar indeed. Okay, so um, I guess some very practical steps for, for step four now is menu planning mm -hmm. and um, that's a probably a bit of a decent focus on my blog um, but it's one of the, I guess, menu planning has a, has a very soft spot for me because it pretty much was the one thing that started me on my whole journey as a planning sort of person, organised sort of person. Um, it, I'd been um, a home I had two children. I'd been back in the workforce between baby number one and baby number two. And baby number one was a bit of a dream baby. Baby number two is still what I like to call my challenging child. You know, just I had to learn to parent again. I thought I sort of after baby number one, I sort of thought I knew most stuff about this. You know, this baby sleeps on four hourly cycles, always great. Baby number two was just so different. Um, and it was a lot more hard work, really. And what I often found was that it would get to five o'clock and I'd have a very tired, because the baby didn't sleep much during the day, very tired baby, at um, nine months old or so, on my hip, you know, a, a toddler that, you know, five o'clock they can get that bit way. And it's like dinner was a surprise to me. It's like, where's dinner? What's happening for dinner? And I'd be covered and I'd stand there in front of it. And I very much remember almost at one point just thinking, you know, I used to, you know, I could project management these million dollar projects, I could do all these things, but for some reason to get organize a meal, what, what, why, why is this happening? And then I thought, you know what, I've just got to do some planning, I've just got to do what I used to do at work and bring it across home. And that was one of, I guess, the things that I started me. And it's just like this, all of a sudden something flicked on in my brain going, well, perhaps I should just use some of the techniques, you know, planning and organizing that I used to use and bring them across. And um, menu planning was my first win. And I guess that's sort of what I talked about at the start. If you have to start anywhere, I often say to people, try menu planning because it takes care of a number of things at once. It takes care of the what to cook. It creates your shopping list so you've got that done. And also too, like most families, you know, especially with my, um, um, you know, a growing family, um, you know, the budget, you know, it, uh, it's, it's a really good budgeting tool as well. So if you want to try and, you know, get organised from the start, menu planning is something I recommend to people. Um, a friend once, uh, you, you, as friends you often attract opposite and one of my very best girlfriends has only just started to menu plan recently and that's because she's gone back to work and she has three little ones. And one of the things that um, I, I found hilarious was she sent me this text at one stage and she's like, well you finally got to me, menu planning is the only thing that's saving my family at the moment. She went back to work and one wasn't adjusting to childcare and that sort of stuff but it became one constant that where she could get home from work and she could do it. But before that I said to her, because she still wasn't convinced, I said to her, just note down all the time that you take running errands to the shops, thinking about what to cook, um, you know, and then and all the other stuff that's associated with that. And she stopped counting at about two and a half hours. Now, because I've been doing it for a while and I get my kids on board and my husband on board, which is another great thing about menu planning, and actually you can get the family on board with it. Um, and I can get that done in about 35 minutes for a month. Um, with the shopping list and all that sort of stuff. So it's a really effective use of my time. Menu planning is one of those tasks that sort of, if you're doing it for a week, you can also, it's almost just as easy to go ahead and do it for the next sort of three or four weeks and just use one sort of concentrated, get that single task focus 
single target focus for sort of half an hour, 40 minutes, and then you've saved yourself all this other time, um, which I find sort of works really well. Um, on the, the reference that I've given you, you can download, I guess, a template that we use um, for our family and I actually have a grid where I go around, because my kids' age is from 3 to 13 and we've been doing this menu planning thing probably for about six or seven years now, the kids all know and they sort of often will say towards the end of the monthly cycle, when's the new menu plan, menu plan coming out? And they, they basically contribute four meals each, so the five kids do four meals each. I try to get my husband to do it, but quite often I just end up making up what I want in his slot. He just, you know, <laughs> just doesn't. And if I say things to him, he'll just say like tacos because it's just easy. He doesn't have to think about it too much. <laughs> but you know, from the from the seven of us in our family, and we all choose four meals. Yeah, you know, that's twenty eight meals chosen already. So you know, it's 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 a really easy, quick process. And the other great thing about getting the kids involved, as it does stop some of those mealtime angst as well. They've had buy-in. They know that eventually, sometime in that week, there's going to be a meal that they've put on the menu plan and they like. So, you know, it knows that they, they may not like one particular meal one night, but you know what? They know this is coming up. So you, you don't have to spend so much time with the kids, controlling them to eat and, you know, having those, those dramas over dinner. So look, yours is coming tomorrow night. That's what it is. So menu planning, you know, um, you know, in terms of getting started, you might do for a week or a month, that sort of stuff. There's a whole heap of resources on the page to show you about menu planning, some tools that I have. I've got a free menu planner on the blog. There's also like a 99 cent app as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you can use those. Or, you know, it can be something simple, like especially for people who do work shift work and that sort of stuff. Even if you just write it up like on a whiteboard, that sort of stuff. And, you know, and a lot of people might even just intuitively do it. Um, if you want to get more, um, you know, a bit of efficiency to it, you can sort of, you know, extrapolate it across the weeks and um, get some even more time savings. I think um, I, I started menu planning um, after our second child and budgeting was one of the main reasons we did it. But um, one of the things that I do as well is I use a, um, a, a menu plan, but I cook out of one particular recipe book that week and that's the book that stays out um, all the time and I write down on the menu plan what page it is. I'm not one of these people who would turn up on MasterChef and stick a finger in a casserole and go, yep, that definitely needs more salt. I wouldn't have a clue. I need to cook from, you know, it would either be a Donna Hay book. She does a lot of really quick um, fresh, easy meals, yeah. Jamie Oliver's um, books, uh, might be the Women's Weekly book or it could be my own recipe book of, you know, those, those folders that you have with all the ripped out pages from magazines. And I just find that that helps with the planning and also with the actual um, delivery of it as well. Another tip that I'd suggest, and um, I heard about um, this through uh, Susan Austin, who's the author of Frostbite. She spoke at one of our events recently. Um, has anyone come across Marion's Kitchen? It's Marion Grasby who was on MasterChef. She's got these great little boxes of Asian meals and they are so easy to throw together. They take no time. I cooked the Thai red curry tonight and um, it took 15 minutes from start to finish. And that was it. Wow. Yeah, that so thoroughly great. recommend thoroughly recommend that there. We've got quite a lot of the, the mums online saying that they menu plan and that definitely helps them um, stay organised. We also got a um, the other penny saying a fantastic app in relation to your um, smartphone app. Um, yeah, and lots of people do the yeah, do the, the menu planning for time saving and also the budgeting. Great. Well, I guess it's not dissimilar to menu planning. The next slide talks about advanced preparation. And I guess there's one, one other thing that, you know, I have a blog called Planning with Kids, but one of the things that I, I very much know is that um, you can plan as much as you like, but family life will always throw you something you're not expecting. Um, so you know, little ones don't follow those plans necessarily all the time. You know, kids get sick, cars break down, there's tantrum and there's fights. So one thing that I have just found that has worked through me time and time again is just trying to keep that little step ahead just allows room for manoeuvring when those disasters actually occur and because they will, it just it just happens day in, day out pretty much and I just find my ability to cope if I don't have such tight time pressure is actually far, far superior and by staying calm I find that generally you can circumvent how long a meltdown may occur if I'm calmer. It may circumvent, you know, how, you know, the, the kids go into an all in brawl or it's just a small barney that they're having. So 
a bit of advanced preparation works wonders and we've got a couple of things that we do in our family. The one that works probably that we've just sort of stick to and it's even if you've been out and you get home at midnight, we still do and I guess that's what the photo is, is um, you know, we set the table, we've got a, I guess a little routine of things we do at night um, and one of the links are, are um, in the in the post that I've linked you up to actually goes through is about 10 things we tend to do at the night time. But I guess a couple of the key ones are we do sit the table for breakfast. We've got kids that wake at all different times and we have the cereal out. Basically all they need to do is go to the fridge, get the juice, get their milk and they're ready to get go. Um, and it just means that um, there's already something for them to do and they're not waiting for me and that's when things can happen. I find when kids are waiting for stuff, it's when <laughs> kids tend to do stuff that you don't want them to do. So that sort of gets things nice. Um, I do the lunch boxes the night before. I don't make the sandwiches, but I pretty much do everything else to the point that I can. Um, then, um, you know, if they've got any notices for the school, they'll get down at night. I find them much easier to do there. Um, the kids are responsible for getting their own school uniforms out, but often, you know, depending on when we are in the, the wash, I mean to make sure that they actually, you know, they're off the clothes horse and into their room, so they've got them there. Unstack the dishwasher, you know, make sure there's a general tidy going on. And, you know, those tasks probably take us, and a couple of other things, about 30 minutes. But one of the things is it's 30 minutes and quite often I, at night time, it's some of the last things I feel like doing. But I find 30 minutes at night, it's going to take me at least an hour in the morning to do that with kids interrupting and stopping and starting. Um, so just getting that out of the way at the night just frees me up in the morning um, so that when the preschooler, you know, refuses to put his shoes on and stuff, I've got time to sit down <laughs> with him and just say, mate, you know, we've got, we've got to go to kinder, we've got to put your shoes on. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, because I'm not feeling that rush and pressure because, you know, sometimes I do have presentations and meetings to go to. And it's almost like those mornings are the mornings they'll sense that they don't want there's something going on, so that's when they will really put their foot down about what it is they're going to do or not going to do. Having that time factor up your sleeve by being a bit prepared really, really helps. Um, a few other things I like to do, at the end of the year is a really super busy time for us. So I think it is for a lot of families, sort of, you know, November, December, you start having the end of year parties, you start having, uh, we've got a couple of birthdays, you've got your Christmas parties coming along, you've got um, all the sort of school stuff that happens. And in the meantime, you're trying to get yourself organised for Christmas. And, you know, sometimes Christmas just comes upon you so quickly, you think, how did I not know that was happening either? <laughs> um, so one of the things that I've done for the last few years is, I do like a bit of a Christmas in July preparation and so and it's also been a really nice way to I guess do some of my other goals which is bond with some of my girlfriends. A couple of girlfriends and I will get together and we'll make some really simple handmade things. And it could be something like, you know, we just, you know, decorate like a little candle holder or we'll make you know, button hair ties or do something like that. But we start to make a few handmade gifts, especially for teachers and close friends. But we do it in the middle of winter when we're not probably going out so much. We come over to each other's houses and we just get ourselves a little bit sorted. And then it gets me in a bit of a mood and I start thinking about Christmas. If I'm hosting Christmas, I'll start to think about a theme and a plan. And it just takes some of that and the pressure off. So by the time sort of November rolls around, I can even get um, a bit of a list happening for presents that I might even start looking at stuff and I get my head around, you know, who may want what so I can then be on the lookout for what things I'm not, I don't necessarily buy it all straight away in July or anything, but I put a bit of an outline about who might want this year. Um, that then I can look at for the sales and I can get some good things and I don't end up doing a bit more of that impulse buy or that late minute buy because I can't think about it because I've just had that time to think. And then I end up enjoying Christmas a bit more because it doesn't sort of feel like I'm just doing everything at once. Something else when you've got five kids is not pretty much a weekend that doesn't go by, there's not a birthday party happening and I do a very similar thing. Um, I just wrote a post recently and I've linked to it in the, the sheet with just some, some pretty basic gift ideas that go across you know, a, a decent range like it might be a sewing kit or it might be a creative pencils and mag, you know, like metallic pencils and that sort of stuff. Stuff that you can buy pretty cheaply at sales. Like um, one of the things that happens, is I, I'll generally buy a bit at January at the back to school sales. I'll put together some really nice pencils and paper and that sort of stuff and then just have them there. And that can go across a range of ages, a range of sexes and put them in sort of the gift cupboard. Mm -hmm. So that way, often I find that during the week, you know you've got a party coming and it gets to Friday and it's like, oh my gosh, there's a party on Saturday and now I've got to go and I end up a, I've got to drag everyone out of the house and get the present, and then B, I tend to spend a fair bit more money because I'm under pressure about <laughs> trying to get the present at the right time. So having those things and just having a bit of a cupboard so it just takes the pressure off and finding things that you know kids love and work well and just having them there. That's sort of those advanced prep things that then just really make 
just the, the day to day life a little bit easier and not so much running around. You know, it's one trip to the shop to get four presents as opposed to four different trips to the shop every time the present a birthday party comes around. Oh, that's great. There's a lot of um, comments in here about, yeah, the, the great idea for being um, advanced. The Christmas in July, I think, is such a great idea as well. Um, I know that one of the things that I'd recommend as well is once you've got the habit in place, keep it there. I, I lecture on Mondays at a college and we've, we're on term break. And normally on a Sunday night, I would have everything prepped for childcare drop-off bags and things like that. And I got lazy because I wasn't uh, lecturing and there was no rush. And we were in disarray on Monday morning. We were in a <laughs> flap. There was nothing prepared. The boys took extra long over breakfast and it was a nightmare. So my suggestion would be once that habit is in there, um, keep it, keep it there for sure. Oh, it's, it's so true. Like we, um, our, our boys have, um, they play local football and once a month on Sunday nights they have like a little evening where you go and buy a sausage and a hot dog and drink and whatever. And on the ones that we go and we get back at sort of 8.30 on Sunday nights, you know, everything just, and then they're all tired Monday morning and it's just like, oh my God, why do we go out? Why do we do this? So <laughs> I didn't go the Sunday. I went, no, I'm not doing it. I'm just, just going to have a nice Monday this week. I just yep. want to roll it through. Yeah. The next one, um, point six, is on using a timer, and mm -hmm. it's funny. This sort of sounds really sort of dr draconian, um, but it's you know getting back to I guess the whole time management philosophy. Um, time management does actually require discipline, and it's very much what you said, Penny. It's about creating good habits, and time management very much is about creating good habits and being disciplined. Um, and it does. It just requires you to keep working at, at that sort of stuff. And I've got a couple of timers systems that I use. Um, one, which you'll see on the screen there, is my iPhone timer, and that's for stuff that I use around the house. Online, I use Focus Booster. But the iPhone timer is just a godsend to me. And I use it for a few different reasons. Um, one, I use it for myself. Um, often, you know, with those 15-minute tasks that I spoke about earlier, um, you know, you, sometimes you go into the bathroom, and I don't know if anyone else does this, um, you've got a whole range of different tasks. My aim is just to go in and just give the bathroom a bit of a wipe down. But there's another task that I know I've got to do afterwards, which is I probably want to do it even less. So I end up spending an hour cleaning up in the bathroom, which really probably only needed a 15-minute wipe over anyway. And then I've sort of lost half my morning. Um, and but by setting the timer and just knowing, bang, 15 minutes, time's up, go get out of there, it just makes me switch over because sometimes, you know, we do prefer to do tasks that we like better, you know, and maybe I, I can really hate folding up the washing and I really hate folding up the socks. We have so many little socks in here and I detest it, but it's one of those things that if you don't do, things do fall apart because no one can do it. So, you know, I know that I've got to do the bathroom, but I might sometimes want to do it a bit longer because that avoids having to fold the washing. But inevitably, I'm going to have to do it anyway. So, so you know, it's just like, let's just stick to it. Be a bit disciplined, set the timer. And also sometimes too, you know, when you don't want to do something, if you know all you've got to do is you set the timer, I'm just going to work on this task for 15 minutes. It may be that you're doing a decluttering. Okay, let's just go in and work on the garage for 15 minutes and get that done. Just getting started and just getting over that over the overwhelmed phase is just sometimes enough to kick you along. And I also use it with my kids as well. And um, you know, some of my kids are, are greater at playing autonomously than others. And I've got one in particular who really does love a bit of time with me. It's just the way he is. And his thing at the moment is he loves to play chess. And I'm a horrible chess player. My other boys taught me how to play chess and I cannot finish a game for the life of me. So if we're to sit there and actually play chess to the end, um, it could lose my whole day. And so I set a timer for him and I'm saying we're playing for 20 minutes and when the timer goes off, that's the end, we'll count up the points and we're done and dusted. And he, he accepts that. And he'll often come and say, can I have a 20 minute game of chess? So it's training him, you know, it's about doing that solo task, yes I'll come and I'll do this, but it's finite and the alarm goes off and bang, I'm out of there, I'm back to cooking dinner now or whatever it is. So it works really well for them and for me and, um, and it's, you know, kids do get very used to it and they'll often say to me, if I say I'm going to be 15 minutes, I'll say, well, have you set the timer on that? Like, no, I'm not going to actually, I want maybe more than 15 minutes, but you know, they get the point eventually. Um, Focus Booster is one that I use for online and I use it I guess sometimes because I'm online a lot of the time for work but also to online for personal reasons and I find it really easy for online stuff just to suck away. You know, you could go on to just check your email for five minutes and you can come out five hours later. There's just so much to look at on the internet and there's just so mm. many fun things especially when you're on Pinterest and Instagram and all those sorts of things. Focus I, Booster. Sorry. 
is a online tool and it uses um, the Pomerado technique. And it's basically a time management technique that was created by this Italian guy. And it basically uses concentrated periods of activity where you just focus again solely on one task for 25 minutes and then you move across to more lightweight work. So for me, the way that it, uh, it reincarnates itself is like I might spend 25 minutes writing a post and then I have a break for five minutes and I might go and do Twitter for five minutes or I might go and do Instagram for five minutes or something like that. And then you switch back into the heavy concentrated work. And um, Focus Booster works, so it, you download it. It's a free app. It goes on a Mac or a PC. And basically, it puts a little clock and it ticks away and it sits off an alarm and it goes ding at 25 minutes so that's bang, okay, and then it dings again at five minutes and then you reset it and away you go again. And again, it's just that, you know, you, you know that you could probably work without an alarm for 25 minutes but for some reason having that little number down there and if I've, you know, gone to research a link for my post and I know that's just taking me 10 minutes, I can actually see that's taking me 10 minutes and I think, oh man, I wasted 10 minutes and, and you get back in and you're really, really focused. So, it's just a useful, I guess, accountability tool. And I think sometimes when you do have a lot to do, just having something else that helps you with that accountability can bring you back into that core focus and stop you from sort of flipping from, you know, link to link and from web page to web page and application to application, that sort of stuff. I think that's a great idea. Um, there's one of the girls has also suggested perhaps using a timer, you know, um, for kids getting ready with tasks in the morning as well, so they get an understanding that there is an end time that it's it's not finite the amount of time that they have to actually get ready for school. I know, and we have, um, I guess, what we call a couple of key markers in our morning routine. Mm -hmm. One is 7.30, and my kids are early risers, so they'll get up and read books and walk around and do whatever. But at 7.30, that's it, it's getting ready time. And by 8 o'clock, they need to be fully ready. So they've got loads and loads and loads and loads of time. But, you know, all I have to say to them, it's 7.30. They know that 7.30 means get ready time. Um, and then then at 8 o'clock, bang, they need to be fully ready because we're going to walk out the door in another five minutes. I know um, for some kids who, um, there are some kids that are just more doorly than others and my eldest one, it's funny how karma comes back because as a child, it may sound really weird, I was an incredibly doorly child and I always made people late. It's the only thing that gives me solace sometimes when he's infuriatingly slow and you send him off to do something and he comes back half an hour later because he sat down and read a book. But <laughs> for kids like him sometimes, I know parents that have an egg timer that will just set the egg timer and go, mate, you've got three minutes. Because you could, they, yes, they could have 30 minutes, but they're going to take that full 30 minutes and so they'll just give them three and away they go and it works for them. You've got to muck around with it and see what works for your kids because every kid's different. Some kids don't need that. Other kids do need a bit more of a prod and a bit more of a you know, here's the time, this is where we are at, you need to stick with it and help us get out the door. Yeah, that, absolutely. There's a few mums who, who do that. One of the girls has said that they do it with for their son, uh, their child who's um, in the bath. He loves to stay long in his, in his bath. So when the timer rings, that's an indication that he has to get out of the bath um, as well. So, so that's great. Like it's a great. It's a great time management for, for kids too because they learn to use their manage their time a bit better and they learn that things do have an end time and there's only a succinct amount of time for one activity. So it's a good training for them, I think. Um, the next one is delegate. Mm -hmm. And I guess this is um, a bit of a focus on kids as well and, and partners. And one of the things that I've worked out, like, you know, and it's not, I don't think anyone ever put it upon me, but for some, for a long time, I really thought I needed to do pretty much everything. And then I worked out that really wasn't doing me great service or the kids because they were completely capable of doing lots of things themselves and really, really should be. So um, I'm all for, uh, you know, um, my husband's really great. And I guess one of the things that I've worked out though with my husband, and I think this is probably true of many, as many partners, um, is that he will happily do stuff when I ask him, but will he often necessarily always think about, and he's much, much better now, I guess that's a bit of a training process to be honest, but um, at the beginning when we, I was getting him more involved in doing stuff, he wouldn't necessarily think of doing it himself, but if I asked him to do it, he would do it. But sometimes I think I used to get so frustrated, it's like, you can see the floor being vacuuming, why can't you just do it? So um, one of the things that just to prevent those arguments about what can you see, what you can't see, is he just, he's got delegated tasks that he just does. He is great at ironing, so he does the ironing of a, um, a night, my um, 
secondary school boy needs to have a smartly ironed shirt, so he irons his own work shirts and my son's work shirts. That's his task. That's what he does. I never look at it. I assume it's always going to be done. Um, I don't double check because I think the minute you double check, you're showing them that there's a way out that you might catch them and so sometimes it does take that consequence of things not being happening um, and there's no safety net there. So, you know, um, he also, he's pretty much the one who predominantly empties the dishwasher and sets the table. You know, I'll do the lunches, so we've got that delegation thing happening, so I don't feel I have to martyr myself and do everything. He doesn't have to guess what he has to do, and we work a lot better together because we've just clearly delegated those tasks. Um, with the kids, this is the chart. Again, as you'll see, my eldest was nine. I actually, that was... Um, that was my four son as a nine-year-old. But if you go to the link I gave you, there's a whole list of different charts that I put for different age groups and what they are sort of capable or not capable of. And this is just what they do in the morning. And then they've got jobs they need to do when they get home from school, and they've got jobs that they need to do when they get home from um, get, get home from uh, when they, before they go to bed. Now, setting this up does take time, mm -hmm. and it's one of those ones where you have to invest time to get it back in the end. And sometimes, especially when it's things like when they've got to stack the dishwasher and bring their plates over and that sort of stuff, and sometimes it would be so easy just to take it from them and doing it yourself, but it doesn't work well in the long run. And one of the things that, you know, it's great sometimes to see the proof in the pudding, because you say this and you really believe it, it's my mantra. My, um, my eldest child went to school, secondary school this year, or last year in year seven. He gets himself up. I don't set an alarm. I don't do anything. When I get back from the gym, he's in the kitchen making his own lunch. I still make the younger kids' as lunches, but he makes his own. I never say to him, you need to go to school. You're going to be late. He gets himself out that door and he gets himself on the train. He has to catch two trains to school and he does it all himself. So you know, independence and those things that free up my time. And I think some people go to me, but you're making four other lunches. Why don't you make his? And I say because eventually those others are going to go off to school and they can make their lunches then too. So it's just I'm showing everyone this is the progress in our house. Once you go off to secondary school, you can make your own lunch. Everything's available there for them. It's not hard. It's not like he has to go and buy the food or anything. But it's about that, you know, eventually, it's, you know the whole teach a man to fish motto really it is and doing that with kids, it does free up time for me and gives me my time back. But I do have to put in. You do have to teach them to do their own shoes. You do, and you have to accept that things aren't always done the way you like either. Mm. Sometimes when they've gone off to school, I have to then restack the dishwasher so I can actually put a proper load on. But I don't do it in front of them, um, you know, because it's a bit demoralising. I just wait till they're off to school when I do it. Then, and we, I try and show them regularly. See how we put three bowls down there, and they fit nicely there. And yep, that's the way we go. So it's a it's a training thing for kids too. Nick, I've got a couple of questions here from the girls. Um, the first one is, would you introduce one new job at a time, I guess, as opposed to having multiple jobs? If they've not done any jobs, and it would depend on what they are. For example, like I think it'd be really easy that they need to make their bed, um, tidy their bed and put their clothes away. Those things which don't really require a lot of skill, I'd say if they're not doing them already, you could just bang, yep, these are one things you're going to do. But I wouldn't introduce anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, once they've got that down pat for the week, um, you know, then you might want to introduce um, stacking the dishwasher. But, you know, start the conversation about we're going to start doing things for ourselves in the morning and this is what we're going to do. And start with something really easy that they can do and there's going to be success. And it doesn't mean that they like it because they don't necessarily like it. And sometimes you know, there needs to be a consequence. Like, you yeah. know, for, for us, um, you know, at the night time, you know, um, on the weekend, for example, um, they get a bit of TV. So, but if they've not cleaned their room up properly, well, then they don't get to watch the TV until their room is clean. So they have a finite bedtime. So if they take two hours to clean up their room, they've pretty much lost their TV time. So sometimes you need a bit of reinforcement by having a consequence. You know, and it may be that, um, you know, if they haven't put, you know, if they're not helping and they're not, they're not doing those things, that there there is a consequence that's logical attached to what they're doing. But absolutely, too much too too far will overwhelm them if they haven't done them all at once. Like, you know, stacking the dishwasher, dishwasher sounds like a very simple task, but to to a thought, to like who does it by now? My eight year old does it. It's it's, it's a tricky task. It's 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 a much more than you think it is for them, you know, um, even like my five-year-old, he currently has to like put, the, you know, put the lids back on the milk and put those in the fridge. You know, it takes him a good five minutes to mm -hmm. work out to put the lids on and put them in the fridge. So don't assume that, that they're easy tasks for them and yeah, give them a bit of time between introducing them, I would recommend. Um, the the you speaking about consequences answered another question they had, and just one final question on delegation. Bernadette's asked um, if you pay them pocket money and is it related to the jobs they do or do they 
do it just because they have to. They do it because they have to. They get pocket money, which is completely unrelated to their tasks. And look, you know, this is a, a big issue. There's generally two camps. There's camps like me that just have, my view is they get pocket money as a share of the family funds. And the other is they're members of the family and they need to do work. But they are a bit, they, they are separated. Like if they, if they don't do their tasks, they don't not get their pocket money, but they don't get more pocket money if they do do extra things, for example. And I know some friends that get in a position where they ask their child to do something and they'll say, well, how much money am I going to get for it? And I'll say, mm -hmm. well, you need to just do it. Well, no. And you know, there's, there's pros and cons of either side. We do it this way and it works really well for us. And what ha what's happening is because the kids have had to, have to do stuff from an early age and like, you know, the, the current, you know, he's, my two-year-old is now three. He doesn't know any different. In fact, he has to take his bath. He has to take his own dirty washing from the bathroom into the laundry, and that's just what they do. And if you, it's almost like if you work with your older siblings, it actually the younger ones just start doing it because that's what everyone else does. So it sort of gets a bit easier. It's just I think you have to put in some hard yards with the, with the, with the number ones and number twos if you've got them, and the others tend to follow along a lot easier. Peer pressure works so much better than adults talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. All right, over on to number eight. Plan and prune. And one of the things that I think is really important about time management, time management doesn't mean doing it all. Um, you are going to have to make decisions about what it is you want to do and where you want to spend your time, which is why I started up with that whole thing at the personal goals. Um, it's just not possible to do everything. You know, this year, for example, I'm on the kinder committee, but I've got very low involvement of what I'm doing at the school. In previous years, I've, you know, ran the craft store, I've, you know, done the play group, um, but I've not done anything at the kinder. So you have to work out what are you going to do and don't expect yourself to do everything, you know. Um, I think we all like to feel that we're, we're doing our bit. And I remember, there's, there's moments in, you remember, I remember going to school and I think I had my fourth baby and I said to one of the mums, I've never done canteen duty yet. She said, you know what, my youngest is in grade six. You'll have plenty of time later on, you just don't worry about that now. I was, that was a really sweet thing to say because yeah. I was doing that mother guilt and, you know, my eldest was only in grade five or whatever, for, um, and he must have been in um, grade three or something like that, and you're sort of thinking, oh, you know, I should be doing more. And it was really nice to hear that, and it is okay. You don't have to do anything. And then sometimes I wrote a post about it recently, and I find saying no quite hard, but I'm getting better and better at all the time. And one thing that's really helped me a lot is that, by saying, because I just find no, I just, you know, I don't want to offend people and I do, I do generally want to help. But sometimes saying no to others actually means saying yes to me or means saying yes to my family. And if I frame it like that, I'm actually much better dealing with it because, you know, I get offered a lot of opportunities for blogging and then I'll go off and I'll see other people doing stuff that I've declined. But I think, you know, that's okay actually because instead of being there, I'm now home doing this with my kids that I wanted to do or I'm going out for that run that I wanted to do. So. You know, I've got my goals, I stick to them, and then, you know, when saying no, I've actually got to the point now where if you, you click through onto um, the, the link that I've given you, and one of the posts is on reframing the decision, and I actually have a few standard phrases that I use, so sometimes it's like, I really like that idea, but I, I don't have time to do it now, I could help you with then, and I might say July, and I've said that to a few people recently, like they want to catch up, and I've just said, look, you know, I've been really busy, I'm spending a bit of time with the family, how about we meet up in you know, the July school holidays? And I sort of look at you first and go, that's months away. But at the end of the day, that, that's just realistic. That's what I've got to do. I can't get everything in there. Um, so I've, got to, I've shared on that post a couple of those, some different phrases they're using. And sometimes it's just like, no, thanks. That opportunity is really not just for me. Or look, look, I know that that band sounds great and that you'd like them, but I don't think it is really for me. And at the end of the day, what I worked out is people actually don't mind of me that was giving myself um, a hard time about stuff. And it's about me wanting to do it all. So I, I really put the responsibility back onto me and it, it's, it's about me. It's about me, you know, yes, I've got my plan. Now, you know, use that discipline that I was talking about and stick to it, make my decisions, prioritise where I want to spend my time and stop doing stuff that isn't really what I want to do. And don't be afraid to stop doing stuff that isn't really, you know, the best effective use of your time. Now, that's, I guess, you know, a quick summary, I guess, of time management, and um, the, I've actually provided a whole stack of tools and resources on that page that I've given you, but I guess to reiterate, you know, there's no one, you know, quick tool that's ever going to 
fix your time management issues. And for me, you know, there's times where I manage my time much, much better than others. And one of the things that's a big eye opener to me is I manage my time better when I'm well rested and when I've looked after myself. So an overriding factor through all of this is, you know, look after yourself, make sure that you factor in time for yourself. And you know, time management does require discipline. Set your goals, set up a structure to work out what you want to spend your time on. And then, you know, and we all you know, you, you, you get those times where you've overloaded yourself and then you live and learn and you move on again um, and, and keep, working at, keep working at it because that's what it does. It requires constant work. So I guess just encourage you to give some of them a go. Um, you know, I'm probably one of the most contactable people in the world. There's Twitter, there's Facebook, <laughs> there's the blog. So, um, you know, happy to take any remaining questions now or you can contact me after the webinar and I really appreciate you spending um, time listening to me this evening. So thank you for that and thanks for the opportunity, Penny. You're welcome, Nick. Um, just fantastic. I heard Nick speak. Um, I've heard Nick speak a couple of times actually, and also just loved her website. So, um, if you haven't been there already, guys, and I'm sure a lot of you already have, um, head there and take advantage of the www.planningwithkids.com/time page that Nick has. Um, set up and she is very accessible and very open um, to questions. Um, we might have to do it offline because we've hit nine o'clock already. So guys, thank you so much. As you log out, there will be a survey. It'll take you one, uh, one minute and 20 seconds to do it. I tested it <laughs> this morning. <laughs> so it'll only take one minute and 20 seconds. So it'll just ask of you. Of your time. Yeah, of your time. <laughs> set your alarm, girls. Um, but it'd appre I'd appreciate it if you fill it out. It just helps us make it better for um, for the next webinar and all the ones that we do in the future. Thanks again, Nick. I appreciate it. Hopefully catch up with you soon. Absolutely. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. Bye.